Hey everybody, welcome to Brain Over Belly. I am David Brown from Everest Surgical Institute and Idaho BMI. This podcast is all about solving the puzzle of obesity and the other diseases that are overwhelming our society and shortening our lives. It is high time for a new approach and better understanding of what is really going on. What we are witnessing isn't normal. I want to pivot in a new direction. Let's get started now by putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Thank you for joining us. For the video version of Brain Over Belly, visit our Idaho BMI channel on youtube.com. Hey everybody, this is Brain Over Belly. I'm David Brown from Idaho BMI and Everest Surgical Institute. Welcome, thank you for joining us. Um, welcome Chanel Drucker. Hello everybody. Uh, Chanel is our dietitian here at Idaho BMI. Nice to have you again. It's nice to be back. Thank you. You were on once before and we had a great conversation. Today's topic is, I think, a very important topic. It is calories. Um, what, what is a calorie and really why counting calories, focusing on calories is not a good idea um, and why it really is misdirection and misleading for us to think that that's really the most important thing in food and the food that we eat. So, Chanel, um, in the last 50 years, 60 years of nutrition, healthy food, uh, people receive a lot of advice. There's a million different opinions. But from uh, positions of authority, institutions, um, those who are in a position to give us advice on what we should be eating. You might say there's a hierarchy of priorities sure. mm -hmm. that come from those sources. What would you say is the number one priority as it relates to food and being healthy? I think the largest focus is calories. I and mean, what's at the top of the nutrition label, big and bold, is calories. Mm. Even in in school, right? I was taught, okay, we have to give people, you know, calorie guidelines, men and women, they have to have an exact amount. Um, so I think the hierarchy with that is people focusing on calories, um, people that want to lose weight, right? They're always told calories in, calories out and back and forth. Absolutely. Yes. And I think in the past, I mean, 50, 60 years, that's been the focal point, right? Everybody is focusing on that only, which we're here to kind of debunk that. Maybe not only, but it's certainly yes. top. Yes, and top you make priority. A, you make mm -hmm. a good point. You look at any nutrition label and what is labeled first. And I would say in bold, usually the font is in bold and it's bigger than all the other stuff. It's calories. And you mentioned calories in, calories out. Some people call that SECO mm -hmm. acronym. Calories in, calories out. The idea that, hey, if a person wants to lose weight, simply count your calories and decrease them. And then increase output, in other words, energy expenditure, and we do that through activity and exercise. I agree. I think that is the number one focus uh, as it relates to food, health, especially in the arena of weight loss. I think there's a lot more that goes into that as well, because we live in a society, right, where everybody's unique, and they are. But with that being said, that means you can't give somebody a number to hit and then give that same number to millions of other people as well. Just, it, it doesn't work like that. We're not that simple. I think it's madness. Mm -hmm. So a um, couple of months ago, mm -hmm. my youngest daughter, Lizzie, came to me. I think it was on a Saturday. And she said, hey, dad, let me, let me show you this house. It was on a YouTube channel. Or she said, let me show you this house in Southern California. It's on the market for $239 million. And this caught her eye. And so we watched this video and it was like a 40 minute video. Don't remember how many square feet it was, but it, of course, brand new, state of the art, super high technology, absolutely out of this world home. Um, I just can't imagine purchasing, owning, you know, just out of this world right. luxury and extravagance. So <clears throat> I want to use this sort of as a launching pad for our discussion is this analogy. Okay, you think of this home in Southern California. Imagine that we want to assess 
the value of that home on the hill. Let's figure out how much it's worth. So let's do this exercise. Uh, a lot of what is in that home, what the home is made from, is lumber. It's wood. Not all of it by a large margin, but there's a lot of wood in there. Let's do this. Let's take a, let's be generous, 20 acre uh, plot of forest. Okay. And we take this home. Let's, let's burn the house down to the ground. <laughs> And somehow, let's measure how much heat is released when we burn that $239 million home. And let's compare it to that 20 acres, say, of forest. And, and in comparing those two numbers, the amount of heat that is released when we burn these two things, okay, that will allow us to assess the value of that home. Sound reasonable? No. Why not? <laughs> because that home is worth way more than that. You're missing it, yeah. right? There's so much that goes into that home as far as organization, technology, it just unfathomable complexity. And by burning it down, it really doesn't do justice whatsoever to what the true value of that home is. Fair enough? Fair. <clears throat> I suggest that that is what we are doing with food when we talk about calories and make the number of calories in a particular food, the focus of how we judge that food. Sound crazy? No, that's a great analogy, I think, to use. Okay, so where did the calorie come from? What is a calorie? Do you know? I do. Of course you do. <laughs> well, let me see if I can explain it well. It's the burning. You have to correct me on this. It's like when you take a food, you place it in a liter of water, and however much energy it takes to raise that water's temperature by one degree is right. a calorie. Essentially, that's right. Okay. Um, it's actually, it's about 200 years old. Really, the French guy, uh, Nicolas Clement, in the 18, 18, 18, 18, 20, mm -hmm. he first described a calorie. And basically what it is, you put this material, whatever it is, you put it into this little machine, this little device, like a little furnace or something, and you actually burn whatever the material is and you're able to measure pretty accurately how much heat is released mm -hmm. when you burn that thing. And so a calorie is how much heat is released when you burn a certain amount or certain type of food. Um, and in foods, it's actually the kilocalories that are listed, right? Right. So a thousand calories is a kilocalorie and that's really what you see on food labels so that's really what our primary uh, focus and priority is in food as it comes from these authoritative sources is to really focus on the amount of heat that's released when these foods whatever they are are burned does that seem reasonable to you no I agree. Considering the age of when that was invented as well. I feel like we're outdated a little bit. Well, truth stands indefinitely yeah. in theory, right? Right. Um, now, is are calories meaningless? No. Yeah. I wouldn't say they're meaningless. I just think they've dictated a little bit too much of how we regulate um, nutrition and our guidelines a little bit. So, I mean, if we're looking at some guidelines that have become popular or trends, you know, fat-free or low-fat are really trendy. And I think sometimes people don't know why that is, but I think it has to do a lot because people are focused on decreasing calories. So, we have three macronutrients, right? So, we have fat, protein, and carbohydrates. And, and protein and carbohydrates, those have four kilocalories per gram, right? But then fat has nine. So a lot of times people are like, oh, you know, if I'm going to lower my calories, the easiest one to go is fat. So now we've kind of become a society where everything's becoming low fat or non-fat and we're just steering, steering towards higher um, protein and carbohydrate consumption. Fantastic point. Mm -hmm. And that's really, well, it's in part where the low fat thinking came from late 70s 
early 80s, was that, hey, on, in the, on that basis, as we measure food, turns out that a gram of fat has more calories or heat released when it's burned compared to protein or carbohydrates. Uh, that and some uh, very extremely questionable uh, science and thinking on fat, dietary fat, and atherosclerosis, heart disease, etc. But your point's a great one. It's, it's a simple math idea that, hey, fat has more calories, therefore it's bad for us. And I believe that that's caused a lot of problems for a lot of people because uh, we need fat, of course. Right, and I think we've seen that as a trend too. As as fat content has decreased in food products, sugar has also increased. But then also, you kind of see the trend that these health issues that were concerned in the '60s and '70s that they did these studies on have still been increasing over time. So I think just even from a like bird's eye point of view, you can see that lowering the fat content of these foods are not curing these diseases. If anything, they've, they well, we know. Yeah, they've made it worse. The prevalence of these diseases, mm -hmm. metabolic diseases, including obesity, have risen extremely dramatically. So whatever it was, whatever we've been doing in theory for the last 40, 50 years isn't working. In fact, things are getting a lot worse. We know that. Um, so the bottom line, I think it's fair to say food is so much more incredibly complicated than what is recognized in the vast number of minds and in circles. You eat something, whatever it is, it is, it is such a complex material. There is so much in there. It is a universe in your hand that you're consuming. Um, mm -hmm. And that it's, this is overlooked, except in the scientific circles of those that are manufacturing food for us. They get this and they understand this. And um, I, I've been doing some reading in periodicals, some journals that are the, it's for the field of food processing, food processing physics, essentially the science behind manufacturing food. And I, uh, I'm a fairly technical guy, you know, I read a lot. My goodness, this stuff is out of this world complicated science. And I printed off just some article titles I thought we could demonstrate. Sure. So, uh, this is the Journal of Food Process Engineering. Hmm. Um, this is a review. Bio nano composites for active and smart food packaging. Uh, effects of mode of heat transfer on puffing quality of rice grain, a modeling and simulation analysis, uh, drying kinetics and quality assessment of, of refractants window dried beetroot. Uh, let's see. Elastic plastic constitutive model of the milled mixture of sugar cane based on phase transition state. You follow that, right? <laughs> That's on the label. Um, modulating the characteristics of jackfruit seed starches by annealing and autoclaving cooling modifications. Novel apparatus for monitoring simultaneously color and bricks of selected fruit juices through RGB image analysis. Experimental investigation of single open pan heat exchanger for jaggery making a novel technique to enhance the performance of a system. Uh, combined effect of sonification and equilibrium modified atmosphere packaging to improve storage stability of Angelino plums during extended storage. <laughs> it goes on. You get the idea. Yeah. This is anything but simple. No. Uh, the way these foods, pseudo foods, are generated and manufactured. Um, I'm a, a bit or a lot of a science geek. I like quantum mechanics. Um, 
won't go into that, but it does apply. I will say though, um, that there are food companies that have gone to the level, uh, Nestle, for example, they employed, uh, scientists, physicists from university of California, um, to employ quantum mechanics to the food processing. So, I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole. Let's just say that the most advanced physics research uh, on planet Earth really is in the, the realm of quantum mechanics, quantum physics. We're talking the physics of black holes and all kinds of stuff. So, this is very, very, very advanced uh, theoretical and physical science. And food companies now are employing this type of uh, science and physics in manufacturing foods. So, that's interesting. What I have a problem with is that those same people, those same companies, those same interests turning around and telling us, the consumer, hey, it's, it's calories. Just focus on that one part. You got to focus on how much heat is released when we burn these incredibly complicated substances. They wouldn't be hiring all these physicists if it wasn't complicated. There's more to it. Oh my gosh. Yes. So um, to me, it's, it's very um, duplicitous and it's disingenuous to focus primarily on calories. So why do they do that? Why is the focus, why is the highest priority calories? Well, really, it pushes responsibility onto the individual. In other words, <clears throat> hey, if, if what we believe, what society believes is that, hey, it's just a matter of calories, then it's 100% the responsibility of the individual <clears throat> to be healthy based on that calorie counting, essentially. And it allows all that engineering to fly under the radar. Even though all that engineering is influencing the brain, the central nervous system, all the tissues of the body quite dramatically in a way that makes it almost impossible to control weight. I think this is why we see people, you know, who come in, it's like, I've dieted my whole life. I've counted calories my whole life. And we see that that's not a maintainable way of one being healthy, but if your goal is to lose weight, then to lose weight as well. Um, there's a ton of diets out there, different protocols, but at the end of the day, it's not just calories we have to focus on. There's so much more to it. It's so much more nuanced. You know, the calories in a 150 calorie bag of Doritos is not the same as the calories in a chicken breast. And I actually saw this one time on social media from another dietitian being like, you know, it's, it's the same, you know, I have a piece of pie is the same as having my turkey dinner. And I'm like, that's not, it's not that simple. One, our bodies are not that simple. You know, we can get into a whole different discussion on gut microbiome alone, right? But just putting that to perspective that calories cannot be the end all be all to sustaining health. Absolutely. So you take the bag of Doritos or whatever it is, mm -hmm. that processed food, which is designed ultimately to bring the consumer back to that food after that actual consumption right. event. Um, and so really the effect of the food, the way it's formulated, you know, refined sugars, vegetable oils, salt, all these things. Um, one of the effects is to alter the brain. We know that, uh, but also to interfere with the system of communication in a person's body. In other words, between the gut and the brain, uh, those communication systems tend to break down. And so ultimately persistent and repeated exposure to these foods diminishes the brain's ability to sense when it's had enough food or energy or calories. So, Yes, food is very different. And if we're eating foods that are breaking down our brain's ability to regulate and control, it doesn't work. It's nearly impossible. Right. I think even a question to ask you know, people listening is, 
if you've ever eaten an, a bag of chips, I just like using that analogy, but a bag of chips, do you feel satisfied after that? Now, if you imagine a steak dinner, you know, and you eat that, I think the satisfaction is there. You can feel it. You can physically feel it. And there's more to it than, you know, it's kind of like what you're talking about. There's so much little mechanics in there that sometimes we don't think about. But if you just put it in that big perspective, like, oh, I guess I don't feel very satisfied after that. You know? Right. There's a reason. You take those two foods, steak, mm -hmm. Doritos. Yeah. After consuming a serving, whatever that is, ask yourself, do I, do I feel like eating still? Right. Um, yeah. That's very different answers. Um, food is just so complex in its structure, organization. So, I mean, I will say this. Ten years ago, people would come in to, and I'd you know, talk to them about food. And I would ask them, hey, do you understand what a carbohydrate is? I would say ten years ago, 80% of people did not. They really had no idea. They'd heard it, but really couldn't define it or give an example. I would say today it's less than 5% of people who don't know what a carb or don't know what a carbohydrate is. And so in my mind, that's progress. I agree. Um, but, you know, so someone who, I don't know, they understand carbohydrates, proteins, fats, that's a tiny step. If, if you really look at how complex structure and the nature of food is, it's a tiny step up in understanding what's really in it. Um, you take protein, and we've talked about this before on this podcast several times, protein. People think, oh, gram of protein. There it is. It's gram of protein from your cereal, your fortified cereal is the same as a gram of protein from, eh, you know, steak. Mm -hmm. Totally wrong. Uh, it has to do with measurement and the ability to really detect or measure effectively how much protein is actually in there. Uh, and, you know, protein is made of amino acids and very different types of amino acids in different foods. And so, you know, some sources of food um, have protein that is in tenfold higher quality. Of course, animal source protein is the best. By far. I think that's a good analogy for people to kind of pick up to, you know, one does not mean one when it comes to anything on a nutrition label. You, know, you right. can't compare certain foods to each other. Um, even if it might look the same on the nutrition label, there's still more that goes into it. So you look at, um, you look at cereals, breakfast cereals. You, you can look at almost any of these manufactured food products in a box, you notice that their composition, just at that simple level, is, is eerily similar. Usually it's a gram and a half, two grams of fat, 25 to 45 grams of carbohydrate and the different types of carbohydrates, and usually two to four, maybe five grams of protein. That ratio is everywhere. It's like you look at potato chips, you look at anything that's processed, and it's very strange that they have the same distribution of macronutrients. Right. Uh, it, to me, it shows, look, it's, there's a formula they're using, and they can change the flavor, the color, and the shape. It's almost all the same stuff, and there's almost no nutritional value in it. Right, they've mastered, they've mastered the trick. And that... Maybe the point is you take that breakfast cereal that supposedly has three to five grams of protein. I'm telling you, it's that what they're saying is protein is virtually worthless to human beings. We, we can't absorb it. It's usually other forms of nitrogen, but it's far more complicated than a food label suggests. Another note is that we've talked a lot about macronutrients, so our fats, proteins, carbohydrates, but... We also have micronutrients, right? Our vitamin A, D, E, K, C, B. I'm sure everybody's heard of at least some of those. And when we're only focusing on these ultra processed foods and focusing on the calories, we then risk these micronutrient deficiencies. And I think that's something to focus on as well. 
Um, you, you just brought up when we were just talking. So vitamin or skim milk, skim milk, it's fat free, but it's fortified with vitamin D. Well, vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. You need fat to absorb that vitamin. So you're putting now that vitamin into a fat free milk. It just does not work. Sounds good. Yeah. Sounds on the label. It looks great, but it's just not the same. And by the way, that vitamin D is a synthetic form. Doesn't work. <laughs> And to me, it, it tells you something when, when something says it's fortified. Like fortified. What does that mean? Yeah. On cereals. Why, why does it need to be fortified? That's a great question, honestly. Why does it need to be fortified? Why does it have it already naturally? <laughs> why do I need scientists or, you know, some manufacturing or some company to add something to my food? To me, it suggests pretty clearly, okay, there's something wrong with that food if it doesn't really naturally provide you with what you need. Right. They had to go above and beyond to add it. And I think that's where sometimes we get kind of tricked too, because when we go to the grocery stores, you know, we're, we're always worried about deficiencies, I feel like. And so if that's right there on the box of the cereal of any product, right? Like added vitamin C, added vitamin something, we get excited, but we should be excited about the foods that just naturally have those foods to begin right. with. They have everything you need. Yes. Just about. If I could throw vitamin C um, supply on a bell pepper, I think we would all get excited. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, you know, all those grain, those cereals, they mm -hmm. say heart healthy. And, you know, that's a whole, a whole other controversy. You get the red heart and it's yeah. a label, it's a brand and they pay for it um, because it's, you know, they believe that it's affecting cholesterol in a way that's helpful and healthful. But it's just, it's, it's crazy. Food, good food, the food that human beings should be thriving on do not need fortification. Um, but you're right. There's a lot more in food that we really never think about or talk about. We get the carbs, the proteins, the fats, the vitamins, the minerals, but there's a lot of other stuff too. Hundreds of things that you never hear about. Uh, retinol, heme iron, uh, you mentioned vitamins, um, Protein, we mentioned that. There's such a big difference in the quality and uh, amounts of protein in different foods, the ability of the body to absorb those foods. Um, EPA, DHA, these omega-3 fatty acids. You only find them in animal source sources, really. Mm -hmm. um, conjugated linoleic acid, you never hear about that. Bioactive peptides, carnitine, taurine. There's literally... Hundreds of other things in foods that really are important for health. And if we rely on food industry and those that manufacture pseudo food, um, it's just misdirection. We're not going to get what we, what we need as humans. Yes. I think we can even see that. I mean, studies have shown, right, your gut microbiome changes in 24 hours. Yep. I think that is wildly untalked about. You could eat um, one way for a day and the next day, boom, it's changed. That Crazy, huh? There's so much more. Which I, I, there's, I hear that, you know, and I, it's hopeful. You know what I mean? Uh, right. Same thing with the cholesterol system with lipids. Um, there's, you know, 20, 15 years ago, I sort of had this sense that, okay, cholesterol, it's like a, okay, if you're going to make a difference in the lipid panel, it takes months, maybe years. No, it is incredibly dynamic. It changes, you can change a lipid panel, your lipid panel dramatically in three days. Um, but you're right. It's, uh, and kind of going back to this idea of calories, since that's what we're talking about too, I, um, Studies have kind of shown it. So I'll have to, it's taking it from the back of my head, but a person, let's say they went on a 2000 calorie day, but it was full of refined sugars, processed foods, lots of sugars, carbohydrates, something like that. But you take another person and their day was filled with, let's say fruits, vegetables, some meats, things like that. Their gut microbiome, when they did autopsy, completely different. Yep. So that means that Calories can't be that simple if they both, both parties had the same amount of calories. Then that doesn't work. Yeah. Well, it's human nature to want to simplify things. Yes. This reductionist tendency. We see it in the macronutrient wars. Yeah. <clears throat> um, you know, we mentioned that 
for decades, really, the, the focus was on lowering fat. I used to do that 30 years ago. I didn't know any different. Um, <clears throat> more recently, it's, it's, it's fat versus carbs, you know, and I spent years in the, in the camp that oversimplified in one direction that it's all carbs, it's all carbs. And I think it is a really important principle that, in other words, right. carbohydrates in the modern world are doing very little good and they're doing a lot of bad but it's for, even that camp is oversimplifying. And I think there, there's a bigger view that we need to cue into. And I think focusing on brain and central nervous system and that fundamental role in all this helps us see that, I think. I know, I agree. And I think sometimes I what I bring up to people is this is not like a belief system. Like, I don't believe that these are the facts. These are the facts. It's the science. It's It's been proven time and time and again. And, you know, as humans, we want to simplify things, but I think then that means we need to simplify our food choices. Meats, eggs, cheese, you know, fish, dark leafy green vegetables. Let's make that the simplification we yeah. go for. And then we don't even have to really worry about nutrition labels. <clears throat> I uh, have this crazy statement. It's true. <laughs> um, but that is... At every step of processing of food, whatever we're eating, every step of processing is fundamentally introducing entropy into that substance. Entropy, nerdy, second law of thermodynamics, d introducing disorder. Food is complicated. It's, it's incredibly sophisticated just in its structure. And when we are processing whatever it is, wheat or... Whatever it is, we're reducing that complexity. And the flip side of that is we're introducing entropy. And you can, you can see that in human physiology. Processed foods are introducing disorder, oxidative stress, mm -hmm. um, and really disrupting natural systems. I know that's nerdy and maybe over the top in a conversation for another podcast. but It makes sense. That's what's happening. Um, so ultimately the message is again, we have to ask questions, think for ourselves, uh, to some degree, there's this saying in surgery, trust nobody, <laughs> everybody lies. Maybe I shouldn't even say that. <laughs> the, the idea is that ultimately you have to, t you know, it's from residency and right. training and <clears throat> it's a, it's a deep dive into personal responsibility and accountability. You know, you're a young person, you have people's lives in your hands. You have to trust yourself a little bit. It, it, work. it is an exercise in integrity, taking care of people and really, you know, the buck stops here. Anyway, I think all of us have to uh, learn, continue to ask questions, learn everything that we can. <clears throat> and, uh, I think that's how we get one step at a time better and better as a society. Yeah. So parents, um, take care of your kids, take responsibility, uh, <clears throat> natural whole foods, especially those from animal sources are the best foods for human beings. Well, anything else, Chanel? No, I think I could go on for hours and hours, but I think that kind of gets the point across. So no more counting calories, everybody. Yes. <laughs> Because you're missing it. We are missing it if that's our focus. So thank you, Chanel, for joining us. And thank you also for tuning in. This really is all about human potential, optimizing health, and really the well-being of human beings, and as well as their longevity. Uh, this is Brain Over Belly. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you.